All right, in no particular order, number one. Go ahead and compare. Hit pause before we move on to number two. Number two. For problems that use variables like D, H, and S, it's a good idea to make a little list on the side. On our test, you will not be able to use your calculator to see what this program does. You have to figure it out with pencil and paper. So a little column for D, H, and S. They tell us the user chooses 6 for D and 10 for S. And then we have this if-then statement. And if D is less than 6, we'll do this. But D isn't less than 6. So we don't do that, we'll do something else. And this is what the something else is. If D was less than 6, we would have done this. If D is not less than 6, then it's something else. And since it's something else, we'll do 12D. And we'll store that in S. So 72 is in S. And this last line right here will display dollars earned 72. Going on to number three. For my eighth period class, we changed this over here, the highlighted, uh, the yellow highlight, we changed the D to H. That's what was originally intended. But the problem was fine with D um, the way first period and second period did it. For eighth period, if you did it this way, same thing. If D is less than 6 and it's not, then it must be something else. And therefore we do this. And therefore 120 will be stored in S. And what we'll print from this last line is dollars earned 120. All right. Pause if you need to. Number three. For this problem, I ask you to find the mistakes. And there's the very first one there in red. You need to use the input command, not the prompt command. The prompt command doesn't allow us to enter text like pick day one through seven. The second mistake is that an if statement needs to be closed with an end command. And this if statement was missing that. So that was the second mistake in number three. Going to number four, for this problem, it's the quadratic formula problem. There's no one way to present this to the user. Here's one, the one that I chose. I display to the user that this is a quadratic equation. And then I decided to just use the prompt command for coefficients a, b, and c. Calculate the discriminant, store that in D, D for discriminant. All right, so we know that if there's two solutions, the discriminant will be bigger than zero. This is given in the problem, and you might, might remember this from algebra. If the discriminant is equal to zero, then there will be one solution. And if the discriminant is negative or less than zero, then there'll be no real solutions. We can think of these as two solutions, one solution, and zero solutions. So the way I chose to do this, and it's not the only way, but I asked if the discriminant equals zero, then there will be one solution. And I'm letting n represent the number of solutions. Else, if the discriminant is bigger than zero, then there should be two real solutions. So I say then two is stored in n, the number of solutions. And if neither of those is true, then something else must be true. The only thing else that can be true is d is negative, which is this case. So when there be zero solutions. So I say else is zero stored in n. Now every if statement needs an end state command to close it uh, and so you can see we've got an end for the first if and then for the second if and again 
if d is zero, there's one solution. If d is positive, then there'll be two solutions. If neither of those is true, then d must be negative. So if neither of those is true, b else must be true, which is d is negative, so the number of solutions will be zero. That'll do it. Display n, which will be either zero, one, or two, and then display real solutions. Pause if you need to. This wasn't the only way of doing it. You may have done it another way. But this was a pretty efficient way to do it. Okay, next problem, number five, rolling three six-sided dice. Before I show you the code, keep in mind that we're paying attention to the sum of the three dice. So the smallest sum can be if all three dice were one. The largest sum would be if all three dice were six. And since we're counting the number of times that the sum of the three dice is a perfect square, I enumerated every outcome and showed that there are only three ways the three dice can roll and have a sum that's a perfect square. When the sum is four, nine, or 16. All right, so here's what the program might look like. Let the user know that we're rolling three dice. Not required, optional, but I decided to let them know. Um, we do need to somehow solicit for them how many times we're gonna roll the three dice. And since we're keeping count, we need to initialize a counting variable. I chose P for perfect, perfect squares. All right, let's start rolling the dice. In our for loop, there's our three dice. There's the sum I'm storing in S. And now, is it a perfect square? So you can ask that question. This isn't the most efficient way of doing it. But you can ask it with one if statement using the or command. In that blue or command, you'll find when you do second math, and you scroll to the right for the logic drop-down menu. All right, so if any one of those things is true, then our sum is a perfect square. We want to advance our counter. So our counter of perfect squares, P, will advance by 1. Our if statement is closed with an end statement, and our for statement is closed with an end statement. And that's pretty much it. We'll display the results. Display U roll P, perfect square sum. It would be a nice report of the end result. All right, I noticed in classes that a couple students had a better way of doing this orange part. And the way it's done here is pretty nice, especially since there are only three possibilities. But what if our dice were 20-sided dice, and what if there were six, seven, or eight different ways you can get a perfect square? We wouldn't want to ask all of those if s is 4 or s equals 9 or s equals 16 or s equals 25 or s equals 36 or s equals 49 and on and on and on. So there is a, a much more um, efficient, more elegant, more clever way of doing it. And some of you guys came up with it. I'm going to show you two different ways. One of which um, I came up with and another one that I saw a student do. Let's look at the left first. This, can, this test right here will determine if our sum is a perfect square. As will this test. Why do these work? So a couple of things about this. I notice a lot of you are starting to think like a programmer thinks. And so you'll really dig this if you didn't come up with it already. All right, this is actually a command. When you hit the math key, in the drop down menu to the right is N U M number. And under number, you can find the round command and the fraction part command and the I part, which is integer part command. So the fraction part, the square root of a number, will just give you what comes after the decimal point. So for example, if our three dice added up to nine, then the square root of nine equals 9.0 and you can eat we all know 9 is a perfect square and when you take the square root of a perfect square you get a whole number which has a zero for a decimal or fraction part so if the fraction part of the square root of our sum 
is zero, it's going to be a perfect square. Let's look to the right. This is the one that one of our students, one of your classmates came up with. They said, if the square root of our sum, and pretend that that sum was a nine right here, so that'd be a three. The square root of nine would equal three. And then they said, equal to square root of nine when it's rounded to zero decimal places, then it's going to be a perfect square. Let's say that this was actually a five. The square root of five is about 2.23, or about 2.24. If we rounded this right side to zero decimal places, then that would be a 2.0. So is it true that the square root of 5 is the same as the square root of 5 rounded to no decimal places? No, it's not. But if we're doing the square root of 9, which we know is 3.0000, and then if we rounded this to zero decimal places, we get 3. We say, is the square root of 9 rounded to three decimal places the same as the square root of 9? That is. So that will satisfy, that will determine that S was a perfect square. This might make more sense to you than this one. If both of those seem really confusing, you can just directly, you know, explicitly ask how these perfect squares, it just, that can become cumbersome if there's a lot of options. But here we only had three, so it wasn't so bad. All right, we're going to move on to the next problem. So this next problem did a simulation of ice cream orders. We needed to ask the user how many orders we say n. Now for a true simulation, you need to incorporate randomness. You can't just say out of the n orders, 35% of them were chocolate, 55% of them were vanilla, and 5% are the 35 and 55 and 10 percent were strawberry. You can't just say that because then every time you have 100 orders, you're going to have exactly 35 chocolate, 55 vanilla, and 10 strawberry. This is supposed to be a simulation where we know the probabilities and then we let random chance determine what the orders were. So to do that, since we're working with percents and that's the key, percent means out of 100. So we're going to generate a random integer from 1 to 100. All right, so to simulate things when the probabilities are in percents, we will generate a random integer from 1 to 100. Since we're keeping track of the count of chocolate, ice cream orders, vanilla, and strawberry, you can see there in green in the third line that we are initializing those three counting variables. Our loop begins where we're going to generate n ice cream orders. And to determine the flavor that was ordered, we'll generate a random integer of 1 to 100. Uh, in the right box of 100 integers, every one of these integers has an equal chance of occurring. So to represent a 35% chance, we include these numbers. Those numbers will come up just as often as all the other numbers. So since there's 35 of them, there's a 35% chance that one of those numbers will come up. Now we need a 55% chance that uh, vanilla ice cream is ordered. So we need to choose 55 of those numbers. So let's choose 55 of them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. There's 50 numbers. So if one of those numbers are chosen, well, let me back up. There's a 55% chance that one of those numbers will be chosen. Since 
that group highlighted in blue has 55 items out of 100, there will be a 55% chance that one of those is chosen. So those numbers will represent vanilla. And then these numbers, and there's 10 of them, 10 out of 100 is a 10% chance they will represent strawberry. All right, so if x is less than or equal to 35, we have a vanilla order. I'm sorry, chocolate order. So we'll advance the chocolate counter by one. Else, if the C value is greater than or equal to 36, and at the same time it's less than or equal to 90, then we'll have a Hold on a second, we need to make a quick change here. Just that. Alright, if, uh, oh geez. Let me back up a little bit. I'm being silly. Uh, this is the number that we've generated with the random number generator. So if F F for flavor, there we go. I chose F for flavor. If the flavor number is less than or equal to 35, then we have a chocolate ice cream. Okay. So if F is less than or equal to 35, then we have a chocolate, we advance the chocolate counter. Else, if x is greater than 36 and less than 90, then that's going to be one of these. And that means we have vanilla. So vanilla will go up by one, a vanilla counter. And if neither of those is true, then that means our f value must be one of these, which means our strawberry counter goes up by one. And each if statement and the for statement and that'll do it display chocolate c vanilla v and strawberry s and that concludes this video good night